today is the 48th in our series on Middle Eastern Islamic history. Uh, I'm going to finish up the Turkish War of Independence that we started last week. Accordingly, that's where we'll start. All right, so the rules, for those of you who are not familiar, I'm not an academic. This is not an academic presentation, nor are my answers academic. I'm not uh, accredited in history, philosophy, religion, or any of the subjects that we will be discussing. That said, I do um, seem to have a bit of lay knowledge on, on the matters at hand, so I think it might be uh, a useful starting point. And I'll try to address these from a secular, uh, non-partisan uh, perspective. And of course, these are difficult topics, so I would encourage everybody to be respectful. That said, uh, I love interactivity, and of course, tonight should be more interactive than others. Questions, comments, clarifications, please put those in the chat. I do read the chat and will respond in due course. Well, uh, the extent that this is a, a presentation, right, the continuation of the presentation on Turkish on the Turkish War of Independence, I say that these are 101s and 201s, 101 meaning that if you don't know something, I'll, uh, I'll catch you up. And if you do know something, I'll probably tell you something I didn't that you didn't know. That's the 201. Uh, there will be a two hour hard stop, but that probably won't apply uh, tonight. Um, the dates are years of service, meaning that if you see dates below an individual, that is when they served in office, whatever office that was, that's not necessarily their birth or death. This is a recording like the other 47 members of the uh, is, uh, Middle Eastern Islamic History series and the other series that are on our uh, website um, and on our YouTube page. By the way, please subscribe to our YouTube page. The link is there. Um, and uh, I'll put it in the description when I start answering questions. And uh, PayPal donations are always appreciated. The PayPal link is below. Um, PayPal is how we afford to put on YouTube, um, the Zoom, all of these other avenues to provide you with the materials that we do. And I see some of the questions already in the chat. That's fantastic. I will get to those when we do our question and answer session. So we talked about last time that there are sort of three different theaters of the Turkish War of Independence. In the Western part, you have the Greek theater uh, indicated with that green large ellipse. Um, in the South, you have the French theater indicated by the blue uh, circle. And in the East, you have the Armenian theater indicated by the purple circle. Um, as we moved through the years 1919 uh, and 1920, um, beginning uh, and into 1921, uh, we started to see the changes on these different fronts. And sort of in an overview, this is what happened, right? At the very beginning, at the end of uh, World War I, you had the armistice in Mudros uh, in October of 1918. And following that armistice, which was signed by the Ottomans with the British, um, the Entente powers, Britain, France, and Italy, uh, began a land occupation of Constantinople, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, Mehmed VI, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, was acquiescent uh, to this occupation. Um, and he uh, allowed for the rise of the liberal, uh, the liberal party uh, and their minister, Damat Farid Pasha, um, to begin uh, acquiescing to allied demands. Uh, these demand, these uh, sorry, these Entente demands included things like Istanbul trials, the ability for the Entente powers to freely move military divisions in the territory of the Ottoman Empire, um, and other acts which were seen by the majority of the Ottoman Turkish population. Um, and when I say Turkish, I mean that in an ethnic sense, the Ottoman Turkish population as being grossly uh, negligent of their historic rights. And you can see uh, the anti-occupation protests. Um, that was from May of 1919 after the Greek invasion, but there were similar protests throughout Anatolia as uh, as concerns this foreign occupation. And that sort of rolled up uh, from uh, with on one side of the Turkish situation. And on the other side of the Turkish situation, you have uh, you have the Tashkilati Masosa, the agency, uh, sorry, the special organization. And uh, and the special organization was during World War One. It served primarily as the um, shock troops and brigands um, of the Ottoman Empire. Their primary goal was to enforce the deportation orders uh, towards the Armenians and towards the Greeks uh, living within the Ottoman Empire. Those those deportation orders, of course, were parts of the Armenian and Greek genocides, respectively. 
the Tashkilat Masusa was composed of an uh, sorry was composed of a number of different uh, rival groups. Um, those groups ended up working in harmony, but you can imagine their antipathy towards the Greeks and Armenians when I tell you exactly the kinds of people that they were. The first were those coming out of Romania. That's the European part of the Ottoman Empire that was conquered by the Greeks, the Serbs, and the Bulgarians during the Balkan Wars of 1912, 1912 and 1913. Another group were actual criminal offenders. They were released from prison. These are people who were guilty of the crimes of rape, murder, um, and other violent offenses, theft, other violent offenses. Um, and so that combined with individuals more aligned towards spying led to these, uh, the Tashkilat Masosa, the special organization being particularly brutal. And of course, during the period of World War I, uh, resistance to uh, the special organization, whether by Armenians and Greeks or by Turks, Kurds, and Circassians who had conscientious objections to uh, the actions of their fellow Muslims, um, both were illegal. And we have numerous cases throughout World War I of honorable uh, Turks, Kurds, and Circassians who stood um, beside their Christian uh, co-citizens um, to protect them. Not enough, of course, the genocide did take place, but the fact that we have numerous of these uh, criminal trials um, for defending the victims of the genocides shows that there was a lot of debate within the Ottoman Empire over the validity of those kinds of actions and the horror that the special organization was uh, was doing was so injurious that even Muslim citizens were taking uh, a back, uh, were taking a reflection on it. So between the uh, the Tashkilat Masusa, which became the Karakol Jamieti or the Black Hand Society on the one side, and these protests towards the Entente occupation of Constantinople and other and increasingly other regions of the Anatolian Peninsula, you began to have uh, a new uh, core that was forming. Uh, and a third wing of that was that you had Ottoman soldiers who refused uh, to accept their demobilization orders from Sultan Mehmed the Second, Sultan Mehmed the Sixth, and so you ended up from these three streams um, creating the Mudafi Hukuk Jamiat Leri, the uh, societies for uh, the defense of rights. Of course, the defense of rights we're talking about of Turkish and other Muslim citizens of the Ottoman Empire, and so now you can imagine on the Turkish side you have this sort of ragtag uh, military force that's being developed that comes from normal citizens who are angry that the Entente is occupying their territory, uh, from these uh, special organization members who uh, have a history of brigandage and violence, and from the traditional Ottoman military that have defected um, away from the power of the Sultan uh, because they don't believe that the Sultan is operating in defense of the Ottoman Empire. And all of these come together in what's known as the Kuvay Emilia, or the National Army. Um, the National Army uh, is led by Mustafa Kemal uh, as the years progress. Um, one of the fundamental things, right, is that um, Mustafa Kemal uh, begins to develop his own authority, and he creates his own authority through the publication of what's called the Amasya Circular, um, which is a document uh, that gives uh, the Turks a clear direction in terms of the future of their uh, uh, national and social development. In the Amasya Circular, there are basically four points that are made that the independence of the Turkish people is at risk, and that independence is at risk from the Entente powers due to their occupation of Constantinople. And as of May 1919, the Greek occupation at the request of the Entente powers of the city of Smyrna, one of the largest port cities of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so the Turkish future uh, could not uh, be based on what was happening at current from the Ottoman Empire specifically because Constantinople was compromised. The Sultan was basically the plaything of the Entente powers at this point. Uh, he was not acting in the interest of the Turkish citizens of the Ottoman Empire. And so he would call forth Congresses in Anatolia, outside of the power, where the uh, outside of the areas where the Entente powers could easily stop him, uh, first in Erzurum and then in Sivas, um, both of these in the Anatolian plateau, 
hundreds of kilometers away from the nearest allied military position. And of course, uh, that the strength of arms would be the way that the Turks would impose a different solution than the one that the Entente powers were seeking, right? It, they were not looking for a diplomatic solution, they were looking for a military solution uh, to the situation. And when they met in person, they signed what was called the Misaki Mili, the National Pact. And this National Pact argued that all of the areas of the Ottoman Empire with suitable Turkish majorities or the majorities of ethnicities that could be Turkified, um, think places, for example, Kurdish majority regions, Circassian majority regions, Laws majority regions um, would also be considered um, acceptable within the new Ottoman Empire that the national pact would defend but the arab territories south of that dotted line those would not be um sought after by the national uh by the nationalists and instead those would be allowed to become mandates under british or french authority so because of this national pact there was now a certain impetus for what the nationalists based in uh based in anatolia were going to try and achieve the first thing that they needed to do, of course, was to limit the amount of enemies that they were facing at any one time. And so they focused a significant effort uh, in the fall of 1919 and the spring of 20 1920 against the French. When we talked about the Battle of Maraj, especially the Suchu Imam incident, uh, which sparked the battle. But basically, the Battle of Maraj presaged a number of French losses in the south that would uh, eventually lead to in uh, in early 1921, uh, the French really leaving uh, the south of Turkey, ceding that area uh, to the National Pact in, a, in exchange for the current Syrian-Turkish border as it exists today, with the one exception of Hatay region, which would be subject to a plebiscite in 1937. Another thing that we sort of touched on last time, that was sort of where we uh, stopped was that there was a, a religious challenge in what Mustafa Kemal was doing um, by creating this nationalist militia. And that was that he was not respecting the Ottoman Sultan as the caretaker of the Ottoman Empire. For that, for rejecting the Sultan Caliph, of course, remember, the Caliph is the most important person in Sunni Islam. The Caliph has the ability to issue religious orders and is the center of Islamic religious life. So by transgressing the word of the Sultan, uh, Mustafa Kemal was putting himself in a position where he could be seen as an enemy. And in fact, that's exactly what happened when Sheikh al-Islam Durizadeh Abdullah Bey Effendi, who was the highest Muslim jurisprudential official in the Ottoman Empire, issued a fatwa on the 10th of April, 1920, condemning um, all of the National Pact supporters as takfiri, or uh, unbelievers. Um, at the same time, in order to legitimate his struggle, um, Atatürk turned to the, to the Mufti of Ankara, uh, Mehmet Rifat, um, and they issued a counter fatwa, a counter religious opinion in order to justify that no, Ataturk actually was a valid Muslim. The National Pact defenders were valid Muslims. And so you had this conflict really um, to protect the religious base of both of these militaries. Eventually, um, there was a, conflict, a confrontation. And in three months, the armies defending the Sultan more or less collapsed. Uh, this is the Kuvaya in Zibaltia. Um, uh, and the Kuvaya in Zibaltia, um, uh, or the forces uh, to respond or discipline, the forces to enforce order, um, they broke down because significant parts of them defected to the Kuvaya Milie, the nationalist military. Um, other parts of them just retreated, um, and still other parts uh, are, are simply lost. Um, but this effectively ended the possibility of the caliph enforcing the Ottoman Empire um, against the nationalist military, which would now be representative to most Turks of the future of the Ottoman Empire. Now, during 19, uh, 
sorry, during 1920, the Greeks made a significant offensive from their initial landing post, post at Smyrna. And you can see the offensive in, uh, in, 20, in 1920 uh, in the areas that are in dark green. Uh, those And the areas that they were advancing from are the areas in that sort of brownish purple color. They made a number of gains, and the main issue that the Greeks were facing was not Turkish resistance, although that was quite significant. They were in, uh, they were invading areas that were overwhelmingly, we're talking more than 80% uh, Turkish civilians. But the issue is that their supply lines were overstretched, and their finances were also at the breaking point. One of the requirements that Venizelos had made when he pushed for the invasion um, of Smyrna was that the Western powers would give him military and financial backing. Increasingly, as we get into the fall of 1920 and the beginning of 1921, more of the Entente powers are willing to deal with the nationalists um, of Turkey and make a separate peace with them rather than conclude peace with the Greeks, sorry, rather than conclude uh, a different kind of peace that the Greeks would have been more partial to or support the Greek military moving onward. Additionally, the Greeks were committing uh, a number of atrocities, and these atrocities would make it more difficult uh, for the Entente powers to continue supporting them. So in order to capture the gains that the Greeks had made, um, the Allies pressed uh, Sultan Mehmed VI to sign the Treaty of Sevres in August of 1920. This was a treaty that would have granted um, to the British control over Constantinople and the Dardanelles region. It's indicated on the map, um, on the lower left-hand map in purple, in the, in the upper right-hand map in red. It would have granted to Greece the region of Eastern Thrace. It would have allowed the Greeks to continue occupying the area around Smyrna, granted an Italian and French um, sphere of influence in uh, South Western and South Central uh, Anatolia, respectively, uh, extended our, uh, Armenia into the Eastern part of the empire and given some British and French control over a nascent Kurdistan. Now, Sultan Mehmed VI signed this document, but the nationalists absolutely refused to sign it. And the fact that they refused to sign it meant that they were even more uh, legitimate in the eyes of most Turks, given that this Western plan, uh, this Treaty of Sevres, uh, seemed like a way to divide the Ottoman Empire into different pieces. And as we talked about, um, the Armenians never got to really enjoy uh, the large Armenia that had been promised by uh, US President Woodrow Wilson in the Treaty of Sevres, the treaty, that uh, large Armenia was really his idea. And the reason for that was that uh, Musa Kazim Karabekir uh, of the nationalist military was able to launch an invasion um, of uh, Russian Armenia, um, getting to the end of 1920 with a ceasefire um, because Armenia was on the verge of collapsing otherwise. And in fact, that ceasefire held long enough for the Soviets to actually conquer Armenia and bring Armenia into the Soviet Union. Um, so the only reason that Armenia survives today in, in many respects is that the Soviet Union was the better, the lesser of two evils um, when it came to uh, control of Armenia. And the Armenians were willing to suffer through a Soviet occupation rather than uh, annihilation at the hands of the Turks. During Musa Kazim uh, Karabakir's campaign, 60,000 civilian Armenians were killed and hundreds of thousands of Armenians were forced to flee the cities that came under his under the control of his sieges. Now, the nail in the coffin of Greek foreign support, as we talked about last time, was the election of the Royalist Coalition in Greece in October of 1920, sorry, November of 1920. And that monarchist coalition put back in power King Constantine I uh, over his uh, political rival, Eleftherios Venizelos. And the return of the king of Greece to Greece um, was deeply upsetting to the Entente powers. Um, at this point, France and Italy had already withdrawn most of their support, but even the British at this point could no longer continue, arguing that the return of King Constantine I it was effectively a ratification of his neutral stance 
during World War One, um, his pro-German uh, personal stance, his political um, pro-neutrality uh, stance. Um, and because of this issue, um, because of this issue, what ends up happening is that the British end up withdrawing their support, their monetary uh, support for the Greek invasion of Anatolia. And this means that the Greeks will have to manage on their own. I have a question here. Uh, how did the border between Turkey and Armenia get established? Was it a military line? Any ethnic reasoning? If you look at the border in the lower left-hand side, um, you can see what is effectively the modern border between Armenia and Turkey in certain part and Azerbaijan in other parts. There are some slight differences uh, between the border of modern Armenia and the borders uh, in the Treaty of Jumri. Um, but for want of a better term, um, these are the borders. And the reason is very simple. Uh, the river Aras uh, runs along the Western border there. And so it was a very easy, um, it was a very easy uh, border to patrol. And the second point is that um, it was very similar to the historic borders between Russian controlled uh, South Caucasus um, during the period after the signing of the Treaty of Tukmanshai in 1828 and prior to the Russian War of 1878. So for 50 years, that was very close to where the border was. Um, and so it was uh, seen as a reasonable border. Additionally, um, when the Russians uh, were in charge of the negotiations, we'll talk about the Treaty of Moscow and the Treaty of Kars. Um, these two treaties solidified that the Treaty of Jumri borders, which themselves were not valid. The Treaty of Germany was signed after Armenia ceased being an independent country. Um, so it's not a valid treaty. But the Treaty of Kars uh, really formalized these borders. And there are slight differences. Uh, but generally speaking, they follow the River Aras. Um, there's a question here. Did you say last week that Constantine had become ill from a macaque bite? Um, that's a little confusion. Um, Constantine the first was removed from power in 1917. He went into exile. His son Alexander the first became king of Greece. It is Alexander um, who uh, but was bitten by a macaque on the second of October, uh, 1920, and because he was bitten by a macaque, um, he died. And there was a move to bring his father back, who was Constantine the uh, first, living in exile. So during 1921, we start to have this new recognition that if a peace was going to be achieved, it was going to be by either defeating or negotiating with the nationalist forces uh, in the center of Anatolia. And, um, and so you end up having the London Conference. The London Conference tries to pull the Turks aside and have them uh, make an agreement that is somehow related to the Treaty of Sevres, but Mustafa Kemal adamantly refuses. And so the London delegation is unable to create a peace treaty. So this moves us into 1921. And this is when Mustafa Kemal is trying to unify his forces to get rid of the Greek problem. So in March of 1921, he meets, uh, he sends his delegation to Moscow to create an alliance with the new Bolshevik state uh, of the Soviet Union. Now, it's important to realize that at this negotiating table are two countries that don't actually exist from a diplomatic perspective. The Bolsheviks have not solidified international recognition for the Soviet Union by early 1921, and the nationalists have not secured international recognition for what will become the Republic of Turkey uh, in, at this point. But the two countries recognize that both of them are in a serious uh, military predicament and they need to shore up their defenses. From the Soviet perspective, the Southern Caucasus was always a breach point. Now, Iran was within the Soviet sphere, uh, was in the historic Russian sphere of influence. Now it would become the Soviet sphere of influence. They weren't worried uh, terribly about Iran being an issue, but the Ottoman Empire could certainly be an issue, especially if it were under the control of the Entente powers. And so from the Russian perspective, from the Soviet perspective, sorry, from the Soviet perspective, it made sense to finance to a limited degree the, uh, the Turkish 
national army uh, in order to have an ally to the South as opposed to a historic enemy. Remember, uh, if you go back to episode 27, in particular, we talked about the numerous Russo-Turkish wars that stretch back all the way to the year 1580. Um, this was really a shift in Russo-Turkish relations brought about by the situation that both of these countries desperately needed uh, an, an ally. And the Turks needed military equipment, they needed money to finance uh, their war, and the Russians needed uh, a safe southern border. So um, in the Treaty of Moscow, they delimited the border between uh, Turkey, um, as it would be eventually and the Soviet Socialist Republics in the South Caucasus, that's Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Of course, those borders would be hammered out in the Treaty of Kars. You can see those areas which, uh, which became the, the borders. And the Russians provided the Turks with 80, with 80 million lira, uh, which was enough to buy new military equipment and give the uh, and give the Ottomans a substantial event uh, sorry and give the Turks a substantial advantage you can actually see in the picture in the upper left hand side Voroshilov who was the Soviet negotiator and Ataturk when Ataturk was president this is in the year 1937 uh, Voroshilov and Ataturk remained close friends uh, ever since uh, 1921 when uh, when both of them coordinated to have this treaty the Treaty of Moscow signed and there are plaques today in Istanbul, in Ankara, and in other cities commemorating how the Russians supported, uh, sorry, how the Soviets supported uh, the, the Turkish national military when all the great powers of the world were aligned against uh, the Turkish Republic. Uh, one small note is that uh, Georgia is in a unique situation, and we'll discuss it a lot more during the Caucasian Wars, because they made a separate peace treaty with Germany. And so there was a German occupation in Georgia that prevented Georgia from falling directly under the Soviet under Soviet control until a little bit later. So in summer of 1921, the monarchist Greeks did not want to be outdone by the Venizelist Greeks. And so they wanted to show an increased show of patriotism. They removed a number of the generals that uh, that Venizelos had put on the front line, and Constantine I went forward with a new group of generals um, who would be in charge of monitoring the Greek position and pushing forward. And in fact, they pushed quite uh, substantially forward. You can see that sort of light green area. That's the advance of summer of 1921. Um, you can see King Constantine I with the Greek troops. He was autographing flags and providing morale, but the commanders that he brought with him were sycophants more than they were effective commanders. And despite uh, a, a number of victories like uh, at Eski Shahir, which was the Greek city of Dorileo, for those of you who've been following the series for a long time, you may remember in episode 10 uh, and episode 11, we visited the city of Dorileo because it was one of the sites of the First Crusade. Um, and this was another fight between Christians and Muslims at the same site. Uh, Dorileo, of course, is the modern Turkish city of Eski Shahir, which is why it has both names. Um, the Greeks were successful at Dorileo, but unfortunately for them, they were unable to encircle the Turkish forces. So the Turks were able to effectively retreat. So while it was a military victory, it was a strategic loss. And the Turks were able to retreat uh, beyond um, uh, 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 beyond that edge of the map, you can see there, and uh, create defensive positions in the center of Anatolia. And I just have that picture of Anatolian architecture so you can sort of imagine what the towns and cities look like that they were passing through. And then we end up with this, uh, sorry, and the Greeks uh, wanted to pursue uh, the Turks and they managed to pursue them all the way to the Sakarya River. And the Battle of the Sakarya took place on the 13th of September, 1921. And this was a very pivotal battle. The Turkish artillery was able to hold the Greek advance and it became a Turkish victory uh, with numerous Greek losses and prevented the Greek advance from making its way to, uh, to Ankara. Ankara, of course, being the Anatolian capital city of the national, uh, of, of the Grand National Assembly of the Nationalists. Ataturk had a number of famous sayings um, related to this. Probably the most uh, famous one 
was not an inch of the country should be abandoned until it was drenched with the blood of the citizens, referring to that he would not surrender the city of Ankara, the, that nationalist capital city, uh, to the Greeks if they had breached Sakaria. Um, and they would fight in the streets. They would not allow uh, the Grand National Assembly to be forced out of the city of Ankara. Now, there were other members who wanted to move further east, but his view was that if they moved further east, it would be ceding the power to the Greeks and in limiting and limiting the power of the National Assembly. Um, and his view that they should defend the land ultimately proved correct because when they won the Battle of Sakaria, it set up a new stalemate between the Greeks and the Turks. The Turks had the river as a strategic defense, um, so the Greeks couldn't breach it. And the Greeks had a number of tepe, or low-lying hills that were in quick succession, which would make an uphill advance very difficult for the Turkish military on the far side. So you ended up having from September of 1921 until uh, the summer of 1922, really no military action on either side, from the Turkish side or from the Greek side. The battle at Sakarya is such an important turning point in the Turkish War of Independence that a number of historians have looked back on it as well and said, for example, Ismail Habib Sabuk has said, the retreat that started in Vienna on 13th September 1683, he's referring to the loss by Suleiman the Magnificent of the Siege of Vienna, stopped 238 years later, referring to the victory at Sakarya. Um, that this was the moment that the Turks finally began to expand outwards again from their uh, repeated uh, losses of territory. And we've talked about those losses of territory throughout the last 20 or so episodes, how the Ottoman Empire has increasingly become smaller and smaller due to repetitive European invasions. But this was the first time that the Ottomans were, uh, sorry, and their successors now, the Turks, um, were able to push back and reclaim territory that had been taken by European states. Mustafa Kemal gathered the, the nationalist forces to him at Don Lumpenar, which is a little bit uh, to the south. You can see it on uh, this map here. If you look at uh, where it says Afyon Karahisar, if you look just to the south of it, you can see Don Lumpenar with the red uh, sword clashing, meaning, of course, that it was uh, a victory by the Turkish forces. And at Don Lumpenar, uh, Mustafa Kemal um, organized his position over uh, overlooking the mountain. And by consolidating his forces, he was able to create a massive Turkish offensive, which took the Greeks by, by surprise. And between the 26th of August, 1922 and the 8th of September, 1922, they were able to undo the entirety of the Greek advance into Anatolia. So in two weeks, they undid two years of work. And they arrived at the city of Smyrna on the 8th of September. Um, this uh, mural is a very famous mural in Turkey, depicting Mustafa Kemal at the head of the Turkish national military, entering Smyrna, uh, being greeted by the Turkish inhabitants of the city. Remember, Smyrna is still roughly half Turkish. Um, of course, the, Greek, uh, the Greeks in Smyrna are not shown in this uh, picture. And in the distance, you can see the fire beginning to rage. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that fire, the great fire of Smyrna. The Turks breached the city in the 8th of September, 1922. On the 9th of September, 1922, we begin to have witness statements talking about the Turks setting fire to the Armenian and Greek quarters of the city. In particular, uh, our earliest testimony is from Minnie B. Mills. She was from the American Collegiate Institute for Girls, uh, a, a U.S. citizen living in the city of Smyrna. And she reports that she could plainly see the Turks carrying tins of petroleum into the houses, from which in each instance fire burst forth immediately afterward. There was not a single Armenian in sight, the only persons visible being Turkish soldiers of the regular army in smart uniforms. This smart in the sense of British smart, meaning that the uniforms were well tailored and organized, showing that this was an intentional act of the Turkish military as retaliation against the Greeks. And it didn't, and it wasn't just that neighborhoods were set on fire, although you can see in the aftermath picture how many of the neighborhoods were burned down due to the, the great fire. But um, Greek and Armenian graves were also desecrate, uh, desecrated. Um, Armenia, uh, sorry, Greek and Armenian leaders, especially Greek leaders, were attacked by Turkish troops. You can see the Metropolitan uh, Christostomos. 
He, and the Metropolitan is sort of like a bishop, but within the Eastern Orthodox churches. And so effectively, he was the chief bishop of all the Greeks of Smyrna. He refused to leave. He was offered the opportunity uh, to leave the city. He refused to leave because he considered the Greeks to be his own people. Um, not only was he killed, his body was mutilated um, and uh, destroyed by Turkish soldiers. We also have numerous uh, accounts uh, of Greeks interacting with Turkish soldiers, telling them not to burn down buildings, and the Turkish soldiers responding along the lines of, we have our orders, um, we will bring these down. Um, so we then have a situation where the refugees uh, began to crowd at the beach, trying to get onto boats that would take them away. By and large, however, the Entente forces that were uh, that were in the port, we have, for example, the HMS Iron Duke, um, a number of British ships like the HMS Iron Duke were there, a few American ships were there, some French ships were there. Um, in total, there were 13 Entente ships in the port, um, all of them uh, basically refusing to take on passengers because they had not get, gotten authority from their governments to do so. And so you had a situation where Greeks uh, threw themselves into the sea or uh, tried to run inland, trying to outpace the fire, uh, most unsuccessfully. Um, it's estimated that, uh, that around 100,000 Greeks uh, and Armenians together perished in the Great Fire um, because of this coordinated effort, and the fires did not abate until the 22nd of September, 1922. So what ends up happening, of course, because of the Great Fire um, and uh, the rest of the Greek escape uh, following the, the great uh, Turkish advance is that the religious variety of Izmir um, basically changes from being roughly 50% Muslim to being entirely Muslim as the Greek, Armenian, Jewish, and European communities all flee the city. And by European, I also include Americans in that. So we then see a direction uh, in addition to the great march towards the sea to eliminate the Greeks and their military position, there was a march on the Greek northeast, uh, the Pontus region. And the Pontus was subject to a number of secondary attacks. Topol Osman, or to uh, Osman the Lame, who you can see there, he had a lame leg, um, was sent to lead these and he took with him many uh, individuals from the Tashkilat Masusa, from the special organization, as well as military soldiers. And they went into um, and they went into the Pontus, uh, committing numerous massacres as they went town by town. Most of the cities in the Pontus had a large Greek minority population, and um, in particular, Topol Osman was known for his sexual crimes, um, namely that he would gather he would kill the men. Uh, and he would gather the women, uh, and the women who were the most attractive, he would keep. Uh, the rest of the women, he would either forcibly march or shoot. Um, and so you would have uh, numerous uh, women who were selected uh, to be subject to forcible rape um, by him and the Turkish troops under his control. You also had what were called the Amasya trials, which were show trials against the Greeks of the Pontus, accusing them of supporting the attempt for the Pontus to become part of uh, the state of Greece. Now, there were individuals who were tried in the Amasya trials who were certainly guilty of that offense. One of them was Nikos Kapitanidis. Uh, he was a, a literary um, and journalistic uh, individual based in the Pontus. He had numerous uh, radical revolutionary ties and argued that the Pontus should be part of the Greek state, or if not part of the Greek state, uh, an independent Greek state uh, in the region. But they also tried and found guilty individuals like Matthias Kofidis, who you can see in the upper left-hand side. And Matthias Kofidis had been a senator in the Ottoman Senate um, during the 1908 uh, period, yeah, 1908 to 1918, serving throughout the First World War. He was respected by both uh, Pontian Greeks and by Pontian Muslims um, as a good representative of the region and a person who was uh, amenable to the needs of both Greeks and Turks and laws, laws being another Muslim minority, Georgian, uh, similar to Georgians, uh, who, live in the, who live in that region in the Northeast. But he was also found guilty by this kangaroo court and sentenced to death. In total, the Amasya trials uh, killed 155 different leaders 
of the Pontian Greek community, and that combined with the uh, uh, village by village massacres, the selection process, and forcible expulsions or flight to Russia, um, Soviet controlled Russia now, um, the Pontian Greek community was effectively eliminated um, by this last wave of attacks. We have a number of other situations that just show um, how the how disorganized uh, the Turkish attacks were from a top-down perspective. Um, you can see the Pontis Merzifon. Merzifon was um, one of the soccer teams. Um, and their stripes, you can't see it here um, very clearly because it's black and white, but their stripes are blue and white, uh, which are the Greek national colors. And because their uh, colors of their soccer jerseys were blue and white, they were uh, believed to be revolutionaries and all shot. Um, regardless of the fact that most of them were completely apolitical. So this becomes the last part of the Greek genocide, this Pontic massacre. And we've talked before about what happened during the war. We talked about the labor battalions. We talked about um, evacuations as ordered by German officials. Um, and we talked about evacuations forced by the Chetes, right? That was the story of uh, Kayekoi, um, the Greek city of Levisi. And now we've talked about the last part, which is the cleansing of uh, the cleansing of uh, the Pontus region by Topol Osman and his brigands. The final part of the Turkish War of Independence came after uh, Smyrna was liberated. Um, Mustafa Kemal directed his forces towards Istanbul, and Mehmet VI was forcibly removed uh, from power. Um, his son was made uh, the caliph but his son did not inherit the title of Sultan. The Sultanate of the Ottoman Empire was abolished, and now there would become a huge, uh, a huge question as to how uh, Turkey would be run. Um, there, there were those who believed that it should be a secular republic, like Mustafa Kemal. There were those like Musa Qasim Karabakir, who believed that it should be a, a republic, but a religiously oriented republic. Um, and so you would have these debates, and we'll talk about that when we get to the Turkish um, Republic period. Uh, that's going to be in three weeks. That's going to sorry, that's going to be in two weeks. We're going to talk about that, and you'll see what ends up being a winnowing of the coalition, right? Because the national coalition is this large coalition between those who are loyal to the uh, to the Ottomans and the monarchy, and then we're going to remove those who are loyal to the Ottoman monarchy from that coalition because of the expulsion of Mehmed VI. But given how successful Mustafa Kemal and his nationalist army had been in uh, forcing the uh, foreign armies out, he had a lot of credit on which to run. And so the majority of his nationalist supporters went along with him as he dismissed uh, Mehmed VI. Remember, Mehmed VI had also signed the, the hated Treaty of Sèvres, which also seemed to sign his, his warrant uh, for losing power. He would spend the rest of his life in exile, mostly in Paris. And because of the difficulty um, that the Greeks were facing, there ended up being, at the, in the finale of 1922, a reshuffling within the Greek uh, world. Uh, Constantine I was removed, and there was a trial, there was what was called the trial of the six, the six being uh, prime ministers and other leading generals who totaled the number of six individuals from Constantine the first government who were tried for disloyalty to the Greek state, given how badly they had shown Greece um, in the Turkish summer advance. And the Venizelists won a victory in the election, putting Eleftherios Venizelos back in power. He reached out to Ataturk to create a new solution uh, based on uh, based on something that would create long, uh, uh, longevity of relations between the Greeks and the Turks. And so they be, and so in the Treaty of Lausanne, they come to the conclusion that the Turks would be able to declare a republic in the historic territories of the Ottoman Empire um, up to the border negotiated with France and the borders negotiated with the Soviet Union and the Persians. The Greeks would maintain a number of the islands uh, but the Turks would get a few as well, um, like Tenedos and Imbros, uh, known by their Turkish names of uh, Gokceda and uh, I think it's I think it's also Bokceda. Um, so 
you end up with this situation um, and then there become what were known as the population exchanges. In order to prevent future revolts, um, it was decided by Venizelos and Ataturk that mirroring the Treaty of neuilly sur seine that was signed with the Bulgarians, that there would be a population exchange of Greeks and Turks between the two states. Now, the term Greek and Turk is misleading here. The definition according to the treaty was based on religious affiliation, not based on ethnic affiliation. So what we end up having are situations where, for example, there are a number of Turkish-speaking uh, Greek Orthodox Turks uh, near the city of Karaman, called the Karamanlides, who were deported from their historic homeland in Anatolia to Greece because they were Greek Orthodox believers. And there were what were called the Grecian Turks, which were Turks, oh, sorry, which were people who spoke Greek language but were Muslim of religion. Um, and they had lived in uh, the Greek peninsula for as long as they could remember, but they were deported to Turkey because of their Muslim religious affiliation. There were some exceptions to areas where um, Muslims would be allowed to live uh, in Greece still, like in uh, like in the region of uh, Western Thrace. There were also some regions where Greeks were allowed to remain within uh, within Turkey, such as in Istanbul or on the island of uh, uh, or on the islands of Tenedos and Imbros, even though they came under Turkish rule. Um, but by and large, we end up seeing roughly five hundred thousand Muslims being expelled from Greece and over 1 million uh, Greeks being expelled uh, from what is now Turkey. Um, and of course, these population exchanges resulted in violence along the road and numerous deaths as well. For those of you who may be curious, that sort of red region south of Turkey is Alexandretta, um, uh, also known as Hatay to the Turks, and that would be subject to a plebiscite. It would be under French control until 1937, and as a result of the plebiscite, it would become part of Turkey. Any questions, comments, concerns on uh, Turkish War of Independence before we go to the question and answers? Who instigated the population exchanges? Um, it was a decision by both Ataturk and Venizelos. I think it was primarily Ataturk who suggested it. I think Venizelos still harbored the Megali idea, the, the great idea, but was beginning to realize that it would not come to fruition, that Greece would not take uh, territories along uh, the Anatolian Aegean coast or the Anatolian Black Sea. All right. I think uh, this is the point where we can close it out. And uh, I'll see everybody next week for the Caucasian Wars. Uh, this Saturday, um, there is, uh, unfortunately, Vuk is unable to make it, but we will continue uh, his Yugoslavia series, which is just about to start. Uh, I'll fill in for him. Um, hopefully, I can do half a good job as he, as he would have done. And then on Sunday, at both, uh, both these are 2 p.m. Eastern time, Saturday and Sunday. Um, on Sunday, we're going to, it's going to be me and Aaron de los Reyes talking about the European Union defense. On Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time, uh, there's going to be the Caucasian Wars, um, which are uh, what happened between 1917 and 1921 in the Caucasus region. It was an incredibly turbulent time uh, for Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Then um, on the 4th of September, uh, we're going to have the final entry into the Islam 101 series with Dr. Sabil Ahmed, and I'll be posing a set, several questions to him that are a little bit more in-depth than what he covered in his original presentations. But of course, there are numerous other um, programs that we're putting on, like our Powerful Women series, our philosophy series. Um, I encourage you to look at the YouTube channel to look at our meetup uh, group. Our links um, are, are in the bottom. Uh, and... Thank you, Richard. This was really good. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. So I'll see everybody uh, on Saturday, Sunday, or Thursday, hopefully. Um, and uh, look forward to it. All right.